We got Dr. Kyle Krupa with us from Crew Lab. We already went over the ideology of your last name, which is obviously Czech. So everyone knows that. I'm glad we can just educate the audience as to where right. your name comes from, how to pronounce it properly. Can you just give us the backstory and your origin story as a PT and then how Crew Lab came to be? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I grew up in uh, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, a small town outside of Scranton, uh, Pennsylvania, and uh, did a business management degree and a psychology degree at uh, Moravian College, which is now Moravian University, and uh, played football there, uh, played safety and corner, um, which was um, you know a lot of fun at the time. It was more important for me to, to play at a smaller school and be a bigger fish in a smaller pond than it was for me to ride the bench and, and get, you know, uh, be a pin cushion for, for yeah. bigger guys on the bigger level. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I had my fair share of injuries, played quarterback in high school. Um, so I had a, a pretty significant shoulder injury when I was in high school. I also threw javelin and, uh, you know, I had a couple of dots at that time that wanted to operate and I rehabbed it. And after that I said, okay, there's gotta be something to this whole rehab process. So, you know, just like any other kind of sport PT that's out there, probably I, I had my own experiences with not only just the sport, but with the injuries within the sport and saw the benefit of, of physical therapy and going through that process. And my psychology degree, to be honest with you, is is probably the thing that that I used most in my my practice and, and also on myself just to, like, get through that whole injury process. Um, but more after uh, you use psychology more than business. Business is psychology. Oh, <laughs> so, good answer. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. and we, we could get into that for sure. Um, but uh, after undergraduate, I did uh, an extra year because I had to get all the prereqs in to, to get to PT school. Um, and then went to University of Miami, class of 2014. And yeah, from, that, from there, it was funny. There was like 54 students in my class, and there was only two of us that stayed in Miami after the fact me being one of them, the other person was from Miami. So uh, this was just, every time I, I went back to Pennsylvania, it was like, there's less and less going on. And there was more and more going on here, more building, more construction, more athletes that I was meeting and, and agents and things of that sort. So it was just like, there, there was a ton of opportunity here that I made sure that I took advantage of my time through my, my years as the DPT the, you know, school. Um, and made sure that I maximized the benefit there yeah. for networking. And, yeah, and now you're all the way into private practice ownership and management. And if I, you know, if your Instagram tells somewhat of a truthful story, you spend a lot of your time with professional athletes. How did you get to that? I uh, I think the biggest thing was okay. So I have a CSCS, but the CSCS is nothing more than just like scratching the surface in terms of where you're okay. It creates a baseline, but then now it's like, how can I, how creative can I get with this baseline? Right. Um, and I, I think at that time, you know, Instagram was just starting to blow up. I didn't really use Instagram as a way to market myself per se, but I had a couple athletes that I was working with through some internships that I had while I was at university of Miami working with, uh, some of their athletes there. And, you know, it's a D1 school that, that is a huge producer of, of NFL athletes. And, you know, there's a lot of agents that kind of hover around there. And just like I said, through my own networking experiences and, and that sort of thing, rubbing elbows with these guys, it turned into like, hey, why don't you train this guy a little bit? You know, maybe do some linear speed training with this guy. Uh, I helped one other guy get ready for his combine prep. So it was just like here and there kind of dabbling into it. And then it's word of mouth from there. And then once that turned into word of mouth is like, I always tell my PTs one, one patient equals three, because yeah. if you're doing a good enough job, then they're going to talk to their friends about it. And they're going to, you know, they're going to send their people over to you. So and, and, that's kind of how it spiraled. Aside, that sounds like a great spiral. Aside from one patient turns into three, I think that's great psychology business advice to start with. Um, what advice would you give to someone who wants to be where you are? Like, give me the one pearl that, to the sports therapist that's listening to this pod that says, man, I want to run something like Crew Lab. I want to treat that demographic or population. What's your one piece of advice to that? My one piece, this is a great question, but uh, <laughs> I have a lot. But I, I would say demonstrate value. You have to demonstrate your value. People think that value is inherent 
once you get your DPT or once you get your CSCS or once you get your, uh, you know, your SCS, whatever it is, mm -hmm. they think that the value is there. And the unfortunate reality is that's what gets your foot in the door. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's just like an MD or a DO. Like if you're going to be the world's best surgeon, you don't just step out of your surgical residency just because you earned it and you put the time in there and you have an MD doesn't mean they're the best surgeon now. Right. Yeah. You still have to demonstrate value. So I think that is overlooked tremendously. And I think that it, we're in the age of fraud right now where people could film for three days straight and make it look like they have a lot of value. And then when I walk into to a meeting with them and we start a discussion, I, I realized, quickly realized that there is no value there. They just had a branding team that helped position them in a way that made them look like they had value. Yeah. I think that that's, that is awesome advice. And I think it's um, so important to take that advice and also apply it to the person in front of you. What is the value that you think they need or want as opposed to yeah. the value you think? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's actually twofold. So the, the uh, you're saying the, the, the up and coming clinician, what kind yep. of value do they need? You have to have, it's not your arsenal if that makes sense. So I don't care that you took a kettlebell class. I don't care that you took some type of BOSU ball balance proprioception class. I don't care that you did the FMS screen. I want to know how you integrate it and make it something different yeah. because athletes learn extremely fast. So something that I teach an athlete within 20 minutes, it probably took me three months to get that down. And then I teach it to them in 20 minutes and I'm like, shit, how do I make this harder? Yeah. How do I make that? How do I progress this? How do mm -hmm. I progress this? How do I make this more? Okay. What, what other element can I add in here? That's going to create that challenge. Yeah. And it's about protecting the athlete number one, but also providing that stimulus and that challenge. And you have to exist within that window. So it's, you, it's not necessarily what certifications you have, but, but it's more so how you apply it and how you add your own level of creativity to it and keep it within that, that bell curve of not challenging versus too challenging and putting them at risk. Yeah, and I, and I think it's it's a small nuance, or I'll piggyback just a little bit, which is sometimes it's so much easier to progress and make harder that exercise, and you have like a hulking linebacker, you want to make it very difficult. I think it's yeah. it's another level. It took you three months to learn how to do that. It probably took you six months to learn how to make it easier. Like how do you <laughs> scale these things, right? Yeah. To still challenge it because. That's when I, I know clinically, that's where I run into some issues is, crap, this athlete, uh, this is way too hard. It's way too hard for them. How do I make it easier, still achieve the goal, um, and and make it safer, right? And allow them to do it's, it. Still I, I, I love the fact that you brought that up because uh, I was just teaching this to a, a student of mine that we had come through. But, you know, this person's coming in two weeks off of a ACL uh, repair. Um, and we had uh, bone patella tendon bone and... Uh, you know, we want to challenge this athlete in a way that they find value in coming to us, right? Yeah. Versus going to a hospital-based system. We're, we're a self-pay model, self-pay hybrid model. But, uh, but you know, you could take that athlete and make them throw up in their first visit. Yep, and, 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 they're, and they still have their stitches on, their, you know, their, their dressings on from the original surgery. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you just made them sweat so hard and throw up and, and vomit just because you, you provided a stimulus that had nothing to do with the knee, mm -hmm. right? And that's and, and not that you have to do that, but you, I'm not saying – I'm not encouraging people to make their athletes throw up within their first visit. But what I'm saying is that there are ways – That would be a good title for the pod. Kind of right, right. Uh, how to make your athlete puke. Very uh, – I got to put that disclaimer out there for sure. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, no, it's, it's really important that, like you said, when you scale it back – okay, that's great, but how do I make this still feel like a workout for the athlete that they're engaged, Yeah, right? Yep. Because keeping them engaged is, is half the battle. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, I think that's great, great advice. It's great business advice. It's great sales advice. Um, I think you're on the money with that. I want to get a little clinical. So do you, in, with the fact that Crew Lab deals with so many professional athletes, these athletes, and by the way, high-level professionals, whoever it is, have very tight schedules. They have demanding training regimens. Um, how do you ensure compliance for this athlete? How do you make sure whatever it is you're prescribing, that they're going to have time to do it? And then overlay that maybe with, they have an overuse injury. So they're already 
they're, they're already kind of in the red. How do you get them to one buy in and two be compliant and not piss their tissues off? Well, the buy in, I think, comes from laying out the whole program in front of them. Right. So that's really important that they see that you have an idea of you have a framework, you have a skeleton that you're going to be working off of. Like it's it's just like any other ACL protocol. But, you know, within that, I'll say, OK, this is we're also going to be doing uppers on this day. Uh, we're going to be doing lowers on this day, you know, whether it's upper push or pull. We're going to be doing more cardiac output, you know, stuff on these days. These are the different, uh, this is our menu block to pick from in terms of, you know, what we could do to challenge your cardiovascular system without, you know, pissing off whatever your injury is and all that kind of stuff. Um, so showing that you have a plan is number one, right, to create that level of buy-in. Mm -hmm. But the uh, specifically the athlete that, that is already a pro, not, not the ones that are going pro, but the ones that are already pro, I mean, these guys have different events to get to they got otas they have you know otas we already planned for but but it's it's mainly the travel schedule that they have to deal with um and flying all around and and it just seems like there's just never enough time to get it all in and the hardest part with that is is that it's like a lot of times i just have to have constant check-in with these people you know of, of okay what did you do between monday and thursday like who did you see what did you have done i have certain athletes that, that they they see five different clinicians right you mm -hmm. know this guy's the guy that i like crack my neck this is the guy that i like crack my back this is the guy that i go to for dry needling this is the guy who i go for neuro, for neuromuscular therapy and it's like dude i can do all those things but it's it's if they have if they want to tap their head and rub their stomach and it makes them feel better and feel like they can run a four three then guess what we're doing that day right so it's like I, I'm not going to convince them otherwise. There's there's a certain level of patient education that you have to do, but I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, okay, well, you have to get your neck cracked with me and you got to do your dry kneeling with me and you got to do your strength and conditioning with me. Otherwise, I won't see you. It's like you got to play within the boundaries that they want to work in with it as well. You know, these are grown men. Um, so, so when it comes to a younger athlete, I just wish that they had more guidance as a younger athlete of like, you know, being able to put your trust into one person. But... I would also say that, you know, South Florida guys are a lot different in, in the sense of, you know, they, they were exploited as young athletes very, very quickly. Yep. And you could take an athlete, you know, they, these guys are people down, down here, like half these athletes that I've worked with, you know, were, were adults, their own parents were betting on their games, you know, at, at 12 years old. So it's like, you're being exploited very quickly. And it's like, it's very hard to trust these to establish that level of trust. Try to find me some kid in Pennsylvania in my hometown that somebody bet on his game when he was 12 years old. You're not, you're not going to find it. Um, so, so they're much more, um, you know, inclined to trust you easier, which makes my job a little bit easier. But in, in terms of taking an athlete and building that trust and, and working around their framework, I think you have to show that level of flexibility and that you're willing to be flexible with them. Um, so, and sometimes it's not perfect, you know, in turn, and you got to be okay with that as a clinician. You got to be okay with the fact that it's like, okay, I've been working on this kid's knee. We're trying to get this uh, lesion to go, you know, to, to subside and, and the swelling to go down. And we're trying to build the quad back up, but he's only coming in, you know, sporadically. He's here three days in a row and then he's gone for a week and he comes back for one day and then he's gone for two weeks. It's like the best that I could do is give them a protocol to work with and then make sure that I have a line of communication of whoever they are seeing so that they understand what I did last. Yeah, that, that, that last piece really hits home for me. The idea that it's rarely perfect, you're rarely rehabbing in a perfectly sterile situation where you get all it is that you want. It is the concept I just read about called wabi-sabi. Wabi-sabi is the idea in Japanese architecture that there will be imperfections and we almost need to celebrate those imperfections and understand that that's the real world versus this like cookie cutter CSCS DPT world where it's like, here's the algorithm and the protocol you follow. These guys got to get on a plane. They got to run out and sprint. You got to celebrate some of that um, and include that. I think that goes a long way. Let's get even more granular. So the athlete comes into crew lab. Um, he's got anterior knee pain. Let's call it patellar tendonitis. He is a professional athlete, so he's involved in, in everything you just described, whether it be flight and travel and other rehab guys and in-house strength, right? How do you go about assessing that athlete biomechanically? And what do you think your first interventions are for this rip roar and patellar tendonitis? Well, it's, I, I mean, my first go-to is usually the, our uh, force plates, you know, for something like that. Um, 
but and and just detecting asymmetry but everybody has to go through a table joint by joint assessment with me and we we do that with uh, i use a micro fet too um i just find it to be the easiest if you want to get into the actual tech that i use yeah, um, tell me you know, tell us a little bit more about yeah my, micro fet too is just a handheld dynamometer um that uh it's it's very like biomechanically speaking it just fits right in the palm of your hand and like i understand bald has a dynamo i understand that kinetech has like you know different products that they use um you have uh they're, they're, the tindex system is another good one it's a pull only it's not a push um system so you know, however you decide to rig it up you just got to rig it up so that it pulls apart instead of pushes together Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, so you, this is what's going to help you to detect the nuances of number one rate of force development and number two asymmetry and, you know, number three, absolute strength output. Uh, but it's also, there's imperfections there because like when guys learn how to take the test better, they score much differently. And that is the problem that I had with, and I'm not trying to throw, I won't say the name of the company. How does that sound? Um, but there are certain systems out there that will create like 3d models of you, um, you know, and, and watch you do a functional movement screen and measure your, your, your distance and your joint angles, uh, you know, with an overhead squat versus a back squat versus a lunge or whatever it might be that you're testing. And this uh, we call motor morons, which means, uh, you know, a patient comes in, the athlete comes in and we're like, okay, go ahead and squat. And it looks terrible because they're not warmed up. They're not activated. They're in their barefoot. They're not in their typical shoes that they wear when they then normally squat, whatever it might be. Um, nothing's turned on. Nothing's activated. I just try to be as consistent as possible and just watch them squat cold. Right. Mm -hmm. And then next thing I know, uh, we go through a whole workout and then I put them through the same exact test and the results look completely different. Mm -hmm. So it's like, that is not an accurate test to me. Sure. So, I don't really care what the person looks like when they squat cold, especially like you were talking about if they got a hot knee like that. It's like, I already know it's going to look like shit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can say the same thing with like, gait, well, are you doing gait analysis? Like, yeah, I'm doing gait analysis when the gait looks normal and I actually want to change something. But mm -hmm. if the guy got a hot knee, guess what? His, his stance time is going to be decreased and his stride length is going to be decreased. Great. You know that. Well, yep. now, now what? Yeah. Right. It's, it's like the same stuff. So it, when people ask me if I'm doing all these things during an assessment, I'm like, I already know he's going to favor the other side. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I could use that as a baseline, but how much of like, how long do I want to keep the athlete? How many of them all came in at the same time? Uh, because they come in in waves, by the way, they don't, it's very rare that they come in by themselves. So they're coming in in waves. Uh, I battery test and then I do what I can with that test and I, and, I guess you call it experience you've been doing it long enough, but it's like really what I want to know is what are the nuances between the joint differences and how your body is moving because of those joint differences. So what I mean by that is like, if you have limited dorsiflexion, do you have limited dorsiflexion because your talus joint is stuck or do you have limited dorsiflexion because your uh, gastroc is uh, tight and your knee is locked out or you have limited dorsiflexion because you're in a poor positive shin angle because your soleus doesn't want to take eccentric control of the forward shin angle. So it's there's three or four different ways that you could be stuck. Do I have a bony block, right? Yeah. There's a lot of different ways that you could have limited dorsiflexion. So really the assessment just comes down to Find the quick and dirty what's stuck and what's weak and then find out what's making it stuck and weak and then develop your plan of care from there. And I think that is the – passive range of motion is the number one – I tell this to all my students. Passive range of motion is the number one most underrated special test that there is, okay? Because if you can't bring your arm up over your head, how many different reasons are there that you can't bring your arm up over your head? Tight lats, a, a bony block at your AC joint. Uh, bursitis, frozen shoulder, inferior capsule, and it's like, okay, well, they're they're stuck overhead. Maybe they don't have strength. Maybe you know, maybe C four shot, C five shot. Okay, so is it, maybe it's coming from the neck. There's so many different things going on there that it's like, but you went and you watched a YouTube video on like their arm is stuck and they have a mobility problem and let's go and stretch with this band that's gonna you know pull you this way. And then you're going to activate your SA and then let it go. And then you're going to stretch back over. Dude, I make those videos. So don't get me wrong. 
All right. So I've seen those I, videos. Exactly. But what I'm getting at is that uh, the passive range of motion component of finding out why somebody can't reach overhead dictates how you're going to treat this person. Because that bandage stretch, it means nothing if they have a bony block. It means right. nothing if they have, you know, a, an inferior castle problem, right? So there's, uh, th that's why we got to get to that granular level. You start macro and then you go micro and then you develop a plan of care from there. So what, so what you're saying is if they don't have it passively, it doesn't matter what band you, you, you add to them. It doesn't matter, you know, what trick you do. They're not going to get it actively. So first assess whether they have the motion passively. Does that sum that up? Oh, no, no, I, I, I always start with active range of motion, right? right. Because if they, if they have a, a motor control issue, you got to know that too, right? Or if it's a weakness issue and a neuromuscular pattern going on. Um, but, so I always start with active, but once I get to passive, right? If, if they can't do it actively, you get, first of all, if they can get there actively, like what do I really care yep. unless they're hypermobile? I yep. don't even really care to do passive. But, uh, but if they could get there actively and everything else looks good, there's not overcompensation somewhere else, like I, I don't really need to dig into that too much further unless they're complaining of pain there. But, but like I said, I go through a full body analysis when these guys come off the field because they're wrecked so, mm -hmm. from, a, from a season. So uh, uh, if I do notice limitation after active range of motion, that's where I say passive range of motion is your number one special test because you got to use passive range of motion to understand why they're limited. Is it is it poor neuromuscular control? Is it weakness? Is it stiffness coming from muscle tissue? Is it stiffness in the in the joint capsule? Is it a bony block? There's only so many things that could be blocking that full range of motion, and you need passive range of motion to determine what that is. And clearly, I'm not the brightest in this phone call. So, so explain to me if I'm missing something. Wouldn't it make sense then to start passive? Hey, you don't have the knee flexion you need passively. So we got to work on that before I start going down the active route. It doesn't matter if they don't have it. If they don't have it passively, they're never going to get it actively. It's not there. If, if they don't have it passively, they're never yeah. going to get it actively. Right. No, I would, I would argue the other. If, if, if they, again, like let's say it's a boggy knee, right? The knee's yep. swollen. Yep. Just because I passively push you to 110 degrees doesn't mean you're never going to get 130. No, uh, you, the will, only thing I, you will get there, but you're not going to get there if you're at 110. Oh, passively. actively, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're not yeah. going to 120 yeah. actively. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah for sure. But wouldn't you want to know what their hamstring strength looks like anyway? There's no, there's no question, but yeah. I can't come up with some type of intervention that's going to change an active insufficiency if they truly have a passive insufficiency. So you're uh, thinking, agreed. Okay. Yeah. No, okay. I agreed for sure. But what I would say is that I would want to make sure that there's no apprehension first okay. before I start pushing the, the limb into Fair. a range of motion. Fair. Yeah. That's, okay. that, that would probably be the only reason why. Okay. Hey guys, quick pause and a quick shout out to this new masterclass that we just launched here at True Sports Physical Therapy. Myself and Dr. Tim Stone put together a masterclass of ACL rehab and we call it from table to turf. And the reason we call it that is because it's going to teach you exactly how to get your athlete all the way from post-op day one with the nitty gritty of regaining all of that range of motion with the tips and the tricks that we use here at True Sports Physical Therapy that gets our athletes better, faster, and stronger. And that's early. And then how do you progress that athlete all the way onto the field with a ball in their foot or a stick in their hand or whatever their sport is and teach them how to accelerate, how to decel, how to change direction, and all the mechanics that go in there. What drills do we use to get our athletes exactly where they need to be back on the field and even better than before injury? And I want you to sign up for that class. Now, you can find it on our website. You can shoot us a direct message and just say, hey, send me the course. It's right now on sale, so make sure you sign up now. It is fully accredited to get you all of your continuing education hours. Sign up for the True Sports Masterclass ACL from table to turf. Thanks, guys. Okay, yeah. so, so that makes sense to me. So, so digging into the patellar tendonitis, and I keep coming back to that pathophysiology because we just see it a ton. We see it a ton, let's say, with like, you know, the NFL linebacker where he's got this hot patellar tendon. Can you yeah. then walk me through, they come into your clinic, they walk into Crew Lab. Um, what is, what do you think, how are you going to determine what's driving that tendonitis? You said that you'll do a joint by joint assessment, they're on the table, 
then you consider um, a full active movement screen. Um, are there any other mechanisms through which you're you're determining what they're what's driving that pathology, and then what are your first interventions based on that? Yeah, it's a, a, a patellar tendonitis is a tough one because tough the, one. The, it really is, and and you're right, it's super common, and uh, the reason why it's super common is because we don't know the cause. Yep. <laughs> so if we knew the cause, we wouldn't see it as often, and and for sure we wouldn't be talking about this kind of, you know having this topic right now. But uh, I would say, you know, if you come from a, an array of things, a, a lot of it being, you know, potentially over internal rotation at the femur, right? Uh, you're getting a possibly internal rotation or even excessive external rotation at the uh, tibia. Um, so you're creating torsion that way and actual like lengthening of the tendon that way through mm -hmm. different ranges of motion. Um, this whole idea of like knees over toes versus not knees over toes, I, I'm not sold one way, shape or form. All I know is I'm going to go based on what the demand of your sport is, right? So um, I think one of the hardest cases of patellar tendonitis that I had was actually an alpine skier that was coming in from Colorado. Uh, and he, you can imagine as an alpine downhill skier, you're, you're taking moguls all, all day. You're in this like eccentric shock absorption of, you know, 40 degrees of knee flexion constantly over and over, yeah. and over 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 again. So you want to talk overuse. I mean, that's overuse, right? Um, so the biggest thing for me is to understand the mechanics as to how the knee is moving. Um, do, is there like a bigger tear that we need to, to consider regenerative medicine for, right? So I'm a huge proponent of stem cell, specifically amniotic. I, I'm not a PRP guy. I don't want to throw any of my PRP docs under the bus, but I always inform my athlete of what I know the most, which is, uh, PRP is very inflammatory and stem cell when it's coming from bone marrow or fat is very inflammatory. And when it comes from MEO is cream of the crop, but yeah. you're also going to pay 20 times the price. Yeah. Uh, but do you want 20 times the results? And if it's a pro athlete, they do, right? Yeah. Because that's going to determine whether or not they get signed. It's going to determine whether or not they get franchise, all kinds of stuff. Right. So, uh, when it comes to the patellar tendon stuff, like I said, I want to make sure that the knee is tracking appropriately, that they have a good heel rocker, they have a good ankle rocker, they have a good toe off. Um, and then assuming that all the mechanics look good, uh, oh, let, let me take a step back. If the mechanics look bad, it's like what came first, the chicken or the egg, right? Yeah. Is that, do they have patellar tendonitis because they don't have a heel rocker? Or do they have patellar tendonitis because, or, or do they not have a heel rocker because they have patellar tendonitis, right? How do you and determine that? I think that's a, that's a great point. How, how there, you... there is no way to determine okay. that because you're not seeing what the athlete looked like before that, right? right? So you don't know. It's impossible to know. And, and to be honest with you, they could have had an ankle sprain and then switched up their gait. You know, six, even if you've been treating this athlete, some of my athletes have been with me. It's, I got one of my guys, tight ends came back yesterday. He's been with me nine years where he figured out the back. And mm -hmm. it's like, you know, the guys chronically had knee issues off and on, but guess what? His tibia is longer than his femur. So yeah. it's, you know, he's one of those guys. So yeah. it's just like, uh, anyway, but, but with all that being said, it's a long lever arm on that. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, what am I supposed to do? Change the lever arm? Can am I supposed to change it? I can't. So yeah. it, it, the, the best thing that I could do is try to make sure that, that tendon is, is thick, right? Um, and which is also controversial because of like, oh, well, tendon thickness, you can pick up on ultrasound and, and it's, you know, it's inflamed and it's, well, okay, well, you're only ultrasounding a tendon that's thick in when it's, that's inflamed. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, so we want to make it thick. So the, the protocol that I typically use when, when, um, these guys are going through any kind of, uh, patellar tendon issues, and this goes for, I don't care if it's of the knee or the elbow or whatever, but we always start with overcoming isometrics. And, you know, we're doing our five sets of 45 second holds. I find that to be the best and most effective. Uh, and I also have them take, uh, and it's always NSF approved, obviously, but I have them take 10 grams of uh, collagen with vitamin C, one gram of vitamin C, 45 minutes before we start our workout. And that seems to um, have a pretty decent effect with um, laying down thickness in, in collagen. That's awesome. Um, I, and I love that there's a nutritional component to it. Talk to me. Can you just... Um explain or uh yeah ex yeah explain i think expound expound on um <laughs> overcoming isometrics tell me what you mean by that you said five by 45 what does that yeah. look like how do you do that yeah overcoming isometrics means that we're pushing into an inanimate object um so you're getting more like if i push into this wall here 
you know, this wall is not going anywhere, right? Versus if I'm just holding my body weight up. Okay, so like if I'm doing a wall sit, that's mm -hmm. a yielding isometric, um, and I'm not getting maximum stimulus on the the muscle tissue. Yep. But, uh, I should say not the muscle tissue, the but tendon. Uh, the tendon. Yep. So you got to remember the idea is to not. It's an overuse problem. I don't want to grow the the muscle any larger than I grow the tendon. So the tendon has a nine day turnaround time. Okay, it's a, a, a collagen and a, a, any kind of like tearing of that tissue has nine days to recover versus muscle tissue has three days to recover. So this is how bodybuilders pop their pecs all the time or pop their, their quads or whatever. It's because the muscle is growing much faster than the tendon can recover. And you, know, you have way too much load that's pulling on this tendon, right? And this could be the same argument for why people are tearing their Achilles more often now. There's an argument for why they're tearing ACLs more, you know, running backs didn't used to squat 800 pounds and quarterbacks didn't squat 900 pounds and then go and run the ball 20 times a game. So that is not something that has been examined and studied, nor could it be consistently moving forward because, right. uh, you know, I, I had a, a, a world record power lifter here, uh, Steffi Cohen, that was, um, you know, I, I think it was at 125 pounds, she pulled 525 or 120 pounds, she pulled 525. And, and she's, she's a great PT. And she's, she's a great, great PT. Yeah. yeah. She was a student of mine. So, oh, yeah. so <laughs> you, you know, know she's a great PT. Exactly. I wrote her letter erect to get in. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but regardless, the you know, when she was coming in, when she was going shooting for that record, we were dealing with a lot of SI joint pain. And she's like, I don't know. I did all the muscle energy techniques and I did the supine sit test and I did all my clamshells and I did all my ISOs this way. And she did everything by the book and I'm laughing because kind of what you were talking about earlier, which is like, dude, nobody studied 125 pound females that could deadlift 525. I'm sorry. Exactly. But yep. There's no literature out there that's going to examine this. So you are putting a huge demand on your body that nobody else has done and you're doing stuff in between sessions that doesn't allow us to follow a normal protocol. Because the normal protocols that you're finding out there that are these randomized controlled trials with double blinded and everything else. I love all those studies. And I'm like, in what freaking world, at least in the athlete world, doesn't it, exist. it doesn't exist. I, I don't know what you, they did five other things the same day, the yep. same day. So, uh, you know, I, I, I go back to telling my, my students, I'm like, every day is another assessment because there's no such thing as like those, uh, which is why we're at a network probably because in network to look access for our uh, flow sheets. And it's yeah. like, it's a joke because it's a, there is no flow sheet. The yeah. flow sheets are supposed to have that like upward trajectory to it. And uh, it's like, dude, I don't know what this guy did between Monday and Friday. Like if they're, if they're coming off a, a really strong strength training day or a field day or something like that, and that knee is lit up. And on Monday we did a whole bunch of balance work. We got all those ISOs in that we needed to do. Guess what? I, I'm not going right back to tissue loading. Right. They just came off of a workout. They just got off the field, and you're going to load the tissue again because a study told you that you had to do that. Good luck getting that guy back in the door. Yeah. That ain't happening. I love that. I think that's such a stark difference between Gen Pop PT and Sports PT. It's the ability to look at that. It's just the flow sheet crap that you just went over is so important to the sports PT that every day is an assessment is gold to the young sports PTs out there because the same thing, this is the way it looks at true sports. We don't have flow sheet. Like WebPT is like, why don't you use our flow sheet option? I'm like, because WebPT isn't built for athletes. There are no flow sheets right. when you're constantly assessing. So I think that's really well put. Um, can you get a little bit more into nine days for tendon, three days for muscle? So if it's nine days for tendon, you're doing overcoming isometrics, um, five rounds of 45 second holds, what does day two look like? Oh, so uh, yeah, I, I, that was your original question. Sorry, I'll, I'll circle back to that. So, so the overcoming isometrics, like I said, is a great stimulus for, think of it like post-action potentiation training, right? So like if I'm pushing against this wall at maximum effort, then I'm getting into digging into as many muscle fibers as I possibly can without actually moving the joint, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm protecting the joint and I'm actually protecting the muscle tissue because there's no eccentric component to pull apart the myosin and actin heads, right? So I'm not splitting apart uh, uh, any sarcomeres in order to lay tissue down. I'm trying to just stimulate uh, stress on the tendon and get the tendon to lay down more collagen, which is why I 
flood the blood with collagen and I flood the blood with vitamin C to shuttle it and then get them to, act, to actually put that stimulus on their body. Um, just like how if I was doing a bunch of hypertrophy work, I'd be shuttling in a bunch of carbohydrates into their body, right? Yep. Quick carbohydrates. So uh, the yielding isometric is a little bit different in the sense that we start with the yielding isometric, which is just like a body weight hold against something. Um, because again, the stimulus is a little bit lower. So if the knee is real hot, then we got to go, you know, yielding isometrics. If it's, uh, if you can tolerate more then we go into overcoming isometrics. Uh, and then the best part about that is like what you said, what does the next day look like? Next day is, is, I mean, not necessarily the next day, but the next I'll call it phase, mm -hmm. um, is to be able to do these isometrics and then superset them with something that is going to be a little bit more loading. Okay. Mm -hmm. So of the tissue. Uh, but really the biggest thing is changing the joint angle, right? So if we change any joint angle that we train, you're hitting muscle fibers and strengthening muscle fibers that are essentially theoretically 10 degrees above and 10 degrees below that, right? So you're hitting a 20 degree arc. So we have to, as if you're talking about the knee, I mean, you, you're going to have to do overcoming isometrics in different ranges. Um, we probably just have like about three of them. I don't, I, I really don't find any, um, necessity and strengthening beyond 120 degrees in knee flexion. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're going to change the angle the next time they're in. You said yeah. you're, you're going to change the load? How, how, how do you uh, do that? Yeah, so, so changing the load meaning if I superset with something. Okay. Uh, so I might change it from, let's say we go from a, a overcoming isometric uh, to a yielding isometric that might just be open chain actually and actually just have them statically hold an open chain. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I have no problem with that. So as long as we're not changing the actual joint angle itself, uh, during the movement, then I have no problem doing that during a, a hot knee. Okay. So, and then as the knee cools down, let's say, mm -hmm. when do you, when do you get a little bit more functional? When do you start going, um, isokinetic? Yeah. So my, my rule of thumb is two out of 10 pain. If anything uh, is, I don't know what you guys are using clinically, but my rule of thumb is if something is causing more than two out of 10 pain, then it's probably doing damage mm -hmm. uh, in, in a bad way, mm -hmm. right? So there's a difference between sore that, you know, hey, I worked out and there's a difference between, you know, this feels like somebody shoving a knife in my tendon. Yep. Um, so, so and, and I always have to be very clear with the athlete. I'm like, dude, you're not working with your strength coach right now. You're working with, I got to put my PT hat on which is when you say, damn, that burns, I need to know exactly what you mean by that because I'm treating your knee right now. So as, yeah, we're doing a bunch of squats, we're doing a bunch of Bulgarians, whatever it might be, but I need to, oh, and then it'll be like, oh, coach, no, it's just, you know, my muscles are all, everything's just fatigued and hot. Like, yeah. okay, good, <laughs> like, that's, yeah. that's what I'm looking for. So I'll, I'll take that response all day, but it's, it's really when they're getting that, uh, anything above two out of 10 stabbing pain, uh, that's when you got to back off and you got to regress that. Yep. But uh, once, I, I mean, once we get past these overcoming isometrics, like I was saying, uh, anything's on the table. I, I mean, outside of like, you know, open chain and ligaments and stuff like that, you know, typical uh, uh, iso, or I'm, I'm sorry, arthrokinematic type stuff. Uh, once we get beyond that, um, as long as it's under two out of 10 pain, it's, it's on the table. Let's do it. Okay. So you're, so you're getting, you're just progressing to get far more functional living by that two out of pain kind of concept. Yeah. But I, I you also need to understand too, that it's like it, when like, cause I, I'm just trying to be granular for, for the, the, you know, especially younger PTs that are trying to figure out how to treat athletes and when they incorporate certain things. It's mm -hmm. like, dude, if they're in a phase that is straight off of their season, right? So like, most guys, especially if they're already pros, most guys are not going to start until after the Super Bowl because they're taking time off. Um, unless they didn't make the playoffs, those are the only guys that are coming in before the Super Bowl. Yep. So most guys, they come in after the Super Bowl. Okay, so once they do that, you got a good four to six weeks of just recovery and corrective exercise. This is not a period where we're doing plyometrics. This is not a period where we, we don't even look at a football. I, there are no footballs in the facility during that time. If you even br smell a football, I'll, I'll kick you out. Don't even smell it. All right. So the idea is to change the stimulus and get their mind off of it. Everything else except getting their body right. So everything revolves around getting their body back to baseline. And I don't care about plyometrics. 
I don't care about anything that's going to add or compound any type of stress to the joint. It doesn't need it right now. If the only thing that matters is restoring normal uh, the d- d- mechanics again, you know, yeah. body mechanics. Um, and it's and it's destroyed. These guys are wiped out. They got their feet all stepped on. They sprained ankles. They got their running backs are lowering their shoulders. The, the, half their shoulders are beat up. The, half of them can't even reach the, the barbell if we try to back squat. So yeah. it's just like, okay, do so what am I going to do? I'm going to do a bunch of safety bar, squat bar stuff right now, or do I want to restore getting their shoulder range of motion back to normal again? Right. So, so it's, it just depends on where they're at in their off season um, and how quick and how much time you're going to have with them. But yeah. like I said, the, that, that first four to six weeks, we're not, I can care less about plyometrics. Stay away from running and jumping. Uh, keep it to all low impact stuff and keep it to corrective exercises. I think that's, that's a great marriage between your CSCS or your strength and conditioning concepts and your PT concepts, right? Because you're looking at your different periods. You're, you're really applying periodization, which comes from your strength background, and then applying the specifics of interventions toward that pathology with your PT hat. So I think that's, that's awesome. It's a great example of being a sports PT as opposed to just either just attacking directly the pathology, which would be your PT, or just continuing along the performance protocols, which would be just strength. So I think yeah. that's, that's, that's really an, an awesome marriage. How much are you communicating with organizations or franchises when you get these guys walking in the door? I'd say it's, it's half and half, to be honest with you. I mean, it just really depends on the organization. It doesn't even depend on the guy so much. It, it you know, it's, uh, I know that when I get a guy from, I don't know, Baltimore. let's say uh, <laughs> Baltimore, yeah, they are very, they want to communicate a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I get somebody from there, they want to communicate. Uh, mm-hmm. If I get guys from New England, they want to communicate, you know, big time. If I get mm-hmm. guys from Cleveland, they don't necessarily want to communicate too much, like it, unless it's like a workers comp or something like that. But, you know, it, it, any kind of workers comp, they want to communi- hyper communication if it's workers comp. Mm-hmm. Uh, because again, they, they want to decrease the amount of liability as much as possible. So the idea is to get them through that rehab process as quickly as possible. So it's ultimately it's the athlete's choice if they, if they want to leave that facility and then go and get independent treatment, um, mm-hmm. which they typically do. Uh, and if they do, then now I have to hyper communicate with the team to make sure that they understand, you know, we have a logical process here. Yeah. Um, I think that's awesome. That's awesome advice. Um, okay. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum as it pertains to the clinical side. So you've calmed down the hot knee. Let's say it was a post-op ACL with patellar tendonitis. That knee is now calmed down. They're nine to 12 months post-op. Well, let's say they're six to 12 months post-op. I want to talk return to sport with you. Um, sure. What kind of, what goes, what goes through your mind as you plan their initial steps back into cleats on the turf? Uh, the biggest thing is understanding the demand of the sport. I mean, it's obviously the way that you're talking right now, it sounds like it's football. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, understanding what the position is that they're playing and what the demand is of that position. Um, what I noticed is there is there's a huge difference. It's – how do I say this? It's important to not treat every athlete the same way. Like I see guys that run a lot of group sessions – and the group sessions should be broken up into, okay, you know, maybe you put running backs over here, receivers over here, quarterbacks have to be in a different uh, all together. You could combine offensive and defensive linemen. I get it. That's fine. It's all footwork stuff. Um, but, you know, and you combine the, the receivers and the, and the DBs, that's, that's fine too. But um, when it comes to uh, understanding the, the demand of, of, what they need to do in their position of the sport. Like I, I realized a couple of years back where I was, I would, we would do sprints and then I was doing one-to-one intervals. So like, like let's say a gasser that they're going to come back down and back in 24 seconds. And then I'd give them 24 seconds rest. They got to do it again. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's essentially like a test that I'm doing just to make sure I'm, get, I'm trying to establish baseline competency, but then it becomes a, a workout in itself. Right. And then now we're doing it once a week or once every other week or whatever it might be. And then I go to his actual um, practices and this kid's getting like four minute rest breaks between reps. Yep. And I actually did a disservice. Like if some people would be like, oh, well, you did great. You over conditioned him. Like he was ready for it. And I would say that that was actually detrimental in the sense that he didn't know how to get his body prepped and ready again quickly 
to get into the next rep when you have four minutes in between each route that you're running. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that's, that's really getting not just sport, but position specific. I also think it speaks to your ability to learn and improve um, yeah. your, your interventions. So I think there's, there's some awesome lessons there. It's also, it's easy to look back and say, well, I didn't, I didn't prepare him ideally. You're lucky um, that you didn't hurt the kid. Meaning like I, I just had a long snapper who, who's running a similar um, conditioning test and the guy blows his Achilles, right? Now, thankfully he wasn't doing that with me, but the question the player now has for sure is why the hell was that my conditioning test? That should right. not have been my, I, I don't have to do that. And so right. you, you gotta think not just when you're rehabbing, but when you're doing the performance side, am I testing exactly what he needs to do? And, and then you think about risk or reward, like how, how much danger am I putting these guys in? So, um, yeah. Yeah. I think well, it's, in, in, right. in that particular case, I, you know, we were much closer to camp and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Prepared for. but, but what I'm, what I'm getting at though, is that getting somebody, the, the stimulus of, and I've learned this a lot with UFC fighters as well. Uh, and, and I'll, I'll just say MMA in general, but like these guys have a way different demand on energy systems mm -hmm. that. I'm going to go back to the wide receiver just because it's much easier. Uh, MMA and, and those energy system demands is very, very complex. And I think that they're some of the best trained athletes in the world. I, and I mean that sincerely. Um, but uh, the, the wide receiver, the demand, the energy system demand, and the demands that you need to calm your heart rate back down and be able to perform at your top with a 24-second rest break with a one-to-one -one ratio of, re of work to rest is way different from working at a hundred percent effort rpe of all the way turned up and they're working at a one-to-one -one ratio they have to learn how to calm their heart rate down the breathing pattern is way different that becomes the focus right mm -hmm. get your heart rate under control and let's get ready for the next rep to give another hundred percent effort right uh versus now you know that you have four minutes and you don't need to spend the energy expenditure trying to calm yourself back down. You could mm -hmm. actually take your time. Mm -hmm. And allowing yourself to do that is, is um, it's a completely different stimulus. And then now knowing how to ramp, ramp yourself back up again and get the neurological output that you need to go into your next rep, again, that's a whole other stimulus. So um, we should have had a mixture of both is what I was getting at. And that's how I've, I've changed my, my programming. Um, when it comes that close to the season, but to, to get back to your original question, which was how do I know how to progress them from one phase to the next? And I, I don't, I don't necessarily have like a, like you have to be able to do a hundred sit ups in a minute in order for me to be able to progress. Yeah, it. Really. Yeah. Um, it's just more or less like, Hey, are you in pain? You know, and, and I go subjectively based on that. These are adults and, and, uh, these guys know their body better than I do. And I would say that, you know, the, the biggest thing that I, I asked them is like, are you good to go? Are you feeling any pain with this knee? Um, I, you know, especially somebody, like you said, that's six to 12 uh, months post-op. My biggest thing is just making sure that they haven't developed bad habits. Mm -hmm. And if they have developed bad habits, then I spend, you know, the first couple of weeks just trying to correct a lot of that. And then we start with a low stimulus so that they integrate those things. So I always say that in the clinic, a lot of the stuff that we do clinically, we don't even post because it looks so ridiculous. So for right. example, like yeah. I, I, I'm just going to give you an example. Uh, like when we sidestep, banded sidestepping, we do it in a way that your knee is so far outside your pinky toe. It looks like you're, it, it's almost looks like you would have had like a, a Swiss ball in between your knees. Yep. That's how we sidestep. Because we want to focus so hard and, the, and the, the actual step because your knee is so far out and the band is around the top of the knee. Um, we really focus on, on hip external rotation and abduction and the step is like two inches. Mm -hmm. So if you're watching from afar, it's like these people are barely moving. Yep. Um, but the whole idea is to over exaggerate the external rotation and over exaggerate the, the, the surface of your pinky toe and digging and creating an arch through the bottom of the foot, right? Um, and really digging that big toe in and having that whole stimulus so that when we go into actual box jumps, you're already 
you created the neurological stimulus that you need, that's the key to unlock the hip external rotators so that I could actually engage that when I go to jump and land. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And same thing in single leg stance uh, when I go to plant. So that's uh, that, that's why I say like over exaggerate it here and then let it communicate over onto the field. And what I would say is like a benchmark for me personally is that, uh, or I should say us as a brand, is yep. to make sure that if I'm going to put that stimulus on somebody, that I actually see it translate on a, onto the field. And if it doesn't, then we get back into the clinic and we do it again. Love that, like a, a test retest scenario. Um, yeah, but it, it has to translate. I, I'm not going to do this and then watch you run the same shitty way that you did before. Because why are we doing it? Because why, why are we doing it? Yeah. Yeah. I, lo I love. I that. will slow down the time. I'll slow down the strides. We'll do wickets. I don't care whatever it needs to take. Uh, you know, I'll have you hold the PVC pipe up above your head and run that way. I don't care. But we need to see a translation of if I'm if your knee is dumping in when you're jumping, running, landing, planning, cutting, then we need to fix that. And that's um, that's what we're doing clinically. And then that, we that's, see the transit. That's awesome. Are there specific functional tests that you're putting them through before you're checking the box and saying, hey, you're ready to roll? I mean, it's I rate of force development testing with force plates. Put them, you know, okay, you put them on the plates. Yeah. yeah. Put on the plates. Yeah. And that's, I mean, you have them jump and, and make sure that there's good symmetry. We repeat it. Um, and, and honestly, like it, it has to be done by the same person because what we've noticed is like, if I train you how to use the force plates in my clinic, for some reason, yep. the results look different yep. <laughs> for some reason. And we try to standardize this thing and it's like, I, I don't understand what, what it is. I, I'm not, you know, the guru on, on force plates, but I will say that, you know, it, it, there seems to be some inter uh, rater reliability issues that are going on there. Intra rater reliability is pretty good, but inter rater is terrible. That's where the psychology, that's where your psychology degree comes in because oh, so yeah. much of performance is, is psychology. Okay. Um, let's move. First of all, Kyle, great synopsis of the way you look at uh, tendinopathies, your interventions, your, your early interventions, your John Harney progressions and what it looks like putting them back on the field. So I love that. Um, thanks. Thanks for all that information. That was really great. That I, that definitely helped my clinical practice. So I appreciate you. True sports physical therapy is growing like wildfire. We have 14 locations soon to be more. We are throughout the state of Maryland. We're in Pennsylvania, in Lebanon and York, Pennsylvania, as well as in Delaware, in Newark and Wilmington, Delaware. Like I said, so many more practices to come and we always need outstanding sports physical therapists. Our treatment style is unique. We are one-on-one -on -one with your athlete for 45 minutes every single session. You do the entire treatment. You do the entire evaluation. And they are in state-of-the-art facilities where you have room to run, throw, and jump, and really get your athlete all the way back to on the field and better and stronger than they were. We also have outstanding salaries, comp structures, bonus abilities, 401ks, as well as a very strong continuing education offering, including in-house continuing education. And we're looking for you. Now is the time, as we are growing like crazy, just shoot your resume over to Yoni, Y-O-N-I, at True Sports PT, or shoot us a DM, and we will hit you back. We will get you in for our unique tried and true interview process and really make a determination that this is the right place for you to grow your career and get your athletes better than ever. We can't wait to hear from you. Let's go to the Eric Cressy lightning round. Couple quick hitters. Do not repeat the question. Do not pause. Just tell me what's on Kyle Krupa's mind. You ready? Uh -oh. well, there's what's, the, what's, what's the best book you've read in the last five years? Becoming a supple leopard. Oh, he's my hero. Did you listen to the former pod of like me and Kelly and, and no, God. no, I didn't know you part of him. Yeah. He's, he's a good dude. I, I took a course with him many years ago, but, uh, but he's awesome. man. He's the only reason I'm still a physical therapist. He just, his passion, his knowledge. It's he, he's a power. Yeah. That's, I mean, like that guy could have that level of like enthusiasm and passion, like, like selling honey or something. It's amazing. <laughs> you know I mean? yes, but, I'm buying that but, I mean, it's, but it's, it's definitely something that, that I tried to emulate in my career. 
and watching him change his own opinion on certain things has made me become a forever student because yeah. I realize like the minute I'm stuck in my ways and I think I figured shit out is the minute that I'm dying. Well, that's why I, I grilled him on knees over toes because he wouldn't shut up about knees driving out over pinky toes, screwing your feet into the floor. I just wanted to know like whether he changed his mind on that or how he would teach it differently. And he gave some great answers. So I think that was like the second pot I ever did. So I probably asked the question poorly, but he was, he was awesome. He was um, a pleasure to have. Okay. So that's a, that's a really good answer. Um, what is the exercise you used to prescribe all the time? And now you wouldn't touch with a 10 foot pole. Overhead squats. Because it could just be done so poorly and create so many bad mechanics that it's better just to segment it all out. And then, and really it's not a functional movement. I mean, what sport do you do overhead squatting outside okay. of actual weightlifting? Yep. That's, that's about it. Um, I think that's a good answer. Um, okay. Next question. Was the movement system you previously hinted at the Dari system? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. Good answer. Good answer. Um, can you share a habit or routine that you believe has contributed significantly to your professional success? Attending professional conferences twice a year. Krupa, you're the best at this lightning round that I've had on here. You don't repeat questions. You don't pause. And that's a, that's a really good answer. Where is Crew Lab in five years from now? We are going to be a performance uh, training based facility that has sports medicine, orthopedic surgery, uh, not invasive ortho, orthopedic surgery, imaging, uh, regenerative medicine, pain management, and nutrition with physical therapy all under one roof. So it's going to be a, a performance training center that like think like D1 almost kind of a deal, indoor mm -hmm. turf, exos type base type thing. Um, but the, the sports medicine component of it is going to revolve around the outside. So meaning uh, it's very about like I've, I've consulted and, and, and met with a lot of different companies that are trying to do something similar mm -hmm. and they can't seem to get all the components under one roof, number one. And number two, they have an issue with the hospitals want to pee on everything. Yep. So uh, orthopedic surgery, what I've learned is those guys want to partner with me really bad on this project, but they're really locked into the hospital system, which I understand. Uh, so what we have to do is, is essentially like a timeshare, uh, mm -hmm. where we have different hospital, uh, orthopedic groups that are all paying, um, to basically share front desk. And when we do that, uh, you know, it's, it's just based on like, you know, surgeon preference, but it's going to be a feeder for those hospitals. But what other models have done is they've allowed the hospital themselves to come in and kind of take over. Mm -hmm. uh, and this happened with, I won't say the name, but somebody moved into a, a, a very sports oriented physical therapy clinic that you probably heard of before yep. opened inside of university of Miami and it flopped big time. And the reason why is because athletes didn't want to go into a sterile hospital environment and try to work out and do combine prep there. Yep. It was just too much of a, it, the vibe is all off. Right. Yep. So the idea is not to pull up to a building and it says, uh, you know, uh, Kyle Krupa's hospital system on the side of it. Yep. If, if it says that, there's a problem, right? Yep. So it, it has to be performance training first, and every uh, ortho and, and medical component that falls underneath it has to understand that that is their Around feeder. Yep. That is their feeder. So I don't care about your brand. I don't care about how good you are at XYZ things. Sports performance comes first, and then that is going to feed your practice. That's beautiful. By the way, that's what the Australian national system used to look like, where, where it was so PT driven. Your first contact point was a physio. Um, yeah. and, and I think they've gotten a little bit away from that, but I think there's gold there. I think it's, yeah. if the PT is the quarterback and, and even more specifically, the sports PT is the quarterback, understands enough to be dangerous of all these different kind of players in this ecosystem, that's yeah. what an athlete's after. Um, I, I love the fact that you use the word ecosystem too, because that's our customer relationship management tool is what helps drive. Like right now, I we just do physical therapy and performance training, so mm -hmm. I cannot promote stem cell injections. Mm -hmm. I can't promote orthopedic surgery. I can't promote MRIs and, and X-rays. Mm -hmm. But if you have it all under one tax ID under one roof, 
Now I can build that into my CRM and anybody can enter our ecosystem from any point there. So if you go and see an orthopedic surgeon in a different state and he tells you, you know, we're a very transient city. So, so we get people from different states all the time. Come in, oh, hey, I need an MRI for my shoulder. Boom, I, we do self-pay. You can go 400 bucks. You can get that, that MRI today. Uh, and they go and they do that. And next thing you know, they're signing up for, for performance training because they're here. Yeah. So they enter the ecosystem from imaging. Yeah. You know? So that, that's the idea. That's really awesome. Um, okay, last but not least, what is a major business failure you've experienced, overcome, and what have you learned from it? Mm, man, that's a, a good one. Uh, I would say not knowing, not having a, getting complacent because time, things are good. And when you get complacent when things are good, it makes you stagnant. So when things are good, you, you start to lose sight of what are your numbers, you know, who, what does your company culture look like? And, you know, things are only good for a very finite period of time. And you still need to be involved. You still need to, and if it's not you, it needs to be somebody that's like you. Uh, you can never really step away from your business completely and expect it to run the same way that it did when you were there. Mm -hmm. So having some type of touch point and accountability measure um, that holds those around you accountable to continue to do their jobs, even though you know you have this great abundance mindset and things are good and people want to come in and work for you and and there, there's nonstop, the phone is ringing and people are applying for jobs and all that. That's all great, but the minute you think like I got it all, I could kick my feet up now. It's like, bro, that's gonna stop pretty soon. Did you, you know? did you actually experience that? Did you get to a point of complacency and realize that that was a problem? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that it was a good uh, point of complacency, but it was a, a point of either we take all this and we grow with it, or we take all this and we uh, do nothing with it. Mm -hmm. And when you do nothing with it, that is, in my opinion, that's a failure. You're supposed to take that and you're supposed to grow with it. Yeah. Um, so that's what I, I would say was a failure was to not do anything with that at that time. Yeah, yeah. I love that and I love that you you learned from it. So Kyle, you have shared a, a breath of wisdom. You are as good as advertised. I am thrilled that Dr. John Harnett begged me to get you on this pod. I am thrilled that I harassed the hell out of you until you accepted the invitation. <laughs> you Thank you. Thank it's you so much for doing that. It's my fault. <laughs> Um, thank you for putting a mirror behind you during this interview so I can see how well your scalp is perfectly covered by that head of hair. You really know how to make me feel bad about myself. So I appreciate all that, Kyle. You've been, you've been great. Any, uh, any last words? And where can this massive following of sports PTs find you? Listen, man, I, I, I really appreciate you having me on here. I, it was a great conversation, and uh, and I really like hearing some of your stuff in the past. I will circle back to that Kelly Starrett podcast, so that I, I'm looking forward to that one. Uh, people can find us at uh, www.crewperformance.com. Crew is spelled K-R-U, just like it is on my shirt. Uh, or you can find us on pretty much any social media platform. It's uh, at Crew Performance Lab. Uh, the only one I would say I'm not on is TikTok and Twitter. Those two I have not found out how to work yet. So yeah, yeah, stay away from them. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the, I'll leave those for the politicians and the uh, twelve-year-olds. So I love it. I love it. Um, Kyle, thank you so much for your time and your knowledge. This has been great. Yeah, you got it, man. Uh, anytime. If you ever want to run it back, we'll do it again. Hell yeah. Okay, thanks for listening, guys. Can't wait to hear how we did. Right. Bye bye.